from the Library of Congress in Washington, D.C. Welcome, everyone. Thanks for coming here on a, on a fine uh, early December morning, uh, afternoon at this point, uh, uh, for our third and final Conversations with African Poets and Writers event of the fall, uh, featuring Kenyan American writer Makoma Wat Nugugi. This series is sponsored by the African and Middle Eastern Division at the Library of Congress and it is presented in partnership with the Africa Society of the National Summit on Africa. I would like to thank the directors of both organizations, Chief Mary Jane Deeb and Bernadette Piallo, who will uh, each follow me with introductions. I would also like to thank Melvo House Press and Claire Kelly for helping make this event possible. Uh, before we begin, let me ask you to do what I'm gonna do right now, which is to find your cell phones and turn them off so that we can make sure that um, it doesn't interfere with the recording. Uh, this event is being uh, videotaped for webcast for the Library of Congress. And if you participate in this event, you will by default give us permission uh, for future use of this recording. Let me also tell you a little bit about the Poetry and Literature Center here at the library. We are home to the Poet Laureate Consultant in Poetry. Uh, our current Poet Laureate is Natasha Trethaway, serving a second term. And we put on literary readings, lectures, and panels like this throughout the year. If you would like to find out more about events like this, you can visit our website, www.loc.gov poetry. You can also check out events sponsored by the African and Middle Eastern Division on its website and check out webcasts of our previous conversations with African Poets and Writers events at www.loc.gov slash rr slash A-M-E-D slash. Uh, finally, let me just describe today's program. Uh, Mr. Nugugi will read, and then we will follow with a moderate discussion led by Ahmed Area Specialist Eve Ferguson. Finally, we will open up the mic, uh, open up the floor to your questions. I will have a cordless mic, which I will pass around. Please wait until I get to you and hand you the mic so we can make sure your question is part of the recording. Uh, so. Without further ado, let me introduce Mary Jane Deeb, Chief of the African and Middle Eastern Division. Thank you. Thank you, Rob. And thank you all for coming. I'm delighted to see you in our um, African Middle East reading room where we hold many of our programs. And as many of you know, this is a division which is made up of three sections. Um, the African section, the Hebraic section, and the Near East section. In fact, we're responsible for 78 different countries in the Near East, Central Asia, the Caucasus, and from the entire continent of Africa, North and Sub-Saharan. We also serve these materials to patrons here in our reading room and organize programs, exhibits, uh, conferences, and other activities that highlight these collections and that inform our patrons about the countries and the cultures these publications come from. Two years ago, in October 2011, the African Middle East Divisions Africa section, in partnership with the Library's Poetry and Literature Center and the Africa Society of the National Summit on Africa, launched a new series at the Library of Congress entitled Conversations with African Poets and Writers. The series consists of a set of six videotaped interviews every year three in the spring and three in the fall, with established and emerging poets, short story writers, novelists, and playwrights from continental and the African diaspora. Programs include a reading and a moderated discussion uh, led by staff in the African section of the library's African Middle East Division. And as uh, Rob Casper just mentioned, our um, uh, interviewer today will be um, Eve Ferguson, uh, who is the reference librarian for East Africa and the Horn of Africa. Today, we are honored 
to host Dr. Mukoma Wanagugi, the 15th speaker in this series. A professor of English at Cornell University, he is a man of many talents, about whom you will now hear from Bernadette Paolo, the dynamic president and CEO of the Africa Society of the National Summit on Africa, and a staunch partner with Rob Casper of this unique initiative of African Literary Interviews. Bernadette. <laughs> Thank you to my dear friend, Dr. Mary Jane Deeb. Good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen, distinguished guests all. I want to thank you, Dr. Mary Jane Deeb and Dr. Robert Casper and everyone, absolutely everyone affiliated with the African and Middle Eastern Division and the Poetry and Literature Center of the Library of Congress. The Africa Society of the National Summit on Africa is very pleased and indeed honored to partner with you as we look toward our third season in 2014 of Conversation with African Poets and Writers. And I'm joined today by two other members of the Africa Society, uh, Patricia Bain, who's our Director of Programs and from Uganda, and Godo Seri, who's our latest intern from Cote d'Ivoire. You know, given the talent on the continent and the increasing number of African writers and poets who are becoming known in the international arena and those in the African diaspora as well. I am confident that this series can go forward for decades and feature a new artist uh, for every, each program. Today, I am particularly pleased uh, to have and to introduce a featured scholar and writer who was raised in Kenya. Kenya, when you, we travel across the country and talk to students and we ask them to name the countries on the continent of Africa, Kenya is always one of the first countries named. And we know why. Uh, we know that our president, Barack Obama's father, was from Kenya. We know of Kenya's economic prowess and position in East Africa. And we know that Kenya is a big tourist destination who hasn't heard of Masai Mara or Mombasa and going on safari and, and what the Kenyan, the warmth of the Kenyan people. What many may not know is Kenya's contributions uh, to the literary community worldwide. Um, on a personal note, Kenya was the first African country I visited in 1985 while on the hill and afterwards I completely switched my career focus uh, to Africa. In short, Kenya leaves a lasting impression. The man whom I'm about to introduce to you and his father are among the prominent figures who also leave long lasting impressions on those who do know their work. Makoma Wangugi is not only very talented, he is versatile, demonstrating his prowess as a novelist, a poet, and literary scholar. He is the author of Black Star Nairobi, Nairobi Heat, an anthology of poetry titled Hurling Words at Consciousness, and his columnist for Ebony.com, a regular contributor to Kenya YouTube magazine. He was shortlisted for the Kane Prize for African Writing in 2009. In 2010, he was shortlisted for the Penguin Prize for African Writing for his novel manuscript, The First and Second Book of transition. I have no doubt that after this appearance and others, he will not only be shortlisted, he will be the winner of the, those awards. Makoma holds a PhD in English from the University of Wisconsin in Madison, an MA in creative writing from Boston University, and a BA in English and political science from Albright College. He is an assistant professor of English at Cornell University. Uh, a former co-editor of Pan Bazooka News and political columnist for the BBC Focus on Africa magazine, his columns have appeared in The Guardian, International Herald Tribune, Chimarenga, Los Angeles Times, South African Labor Bulletin, and Business Daily Africa, and he has been a guest on Discovery Now, Al Jazeera, and the BBC World Series. His essays have appeared in World Literature Review, Black Commentator, Progressive Magazine, and Radical History Review. 
His short stories have been published in Wasafiri, African Writing, Kenyan Review, and St. Petersburg Review, and his poems in the New York Quarterly, Mythium, Brick Magazine, Kwani, and Tin House Magazine, among other places. He was born in 1971 in Evanston, Illinois, and we're proud to claim you as an American, even though you have, were raised in Kenya, and grew up in Kenya before returning to the United States uh, for his undergraduate and graduate education. He is currently based in Norwalk, Connecticut. He is the son of the world-renowned African writer in Gugiwa Thiongo. Um, we appreciate the participation of those of you who are attending this program at the library today. I think we were joined by another distinguished professor because I can't see clearly, but I think that's Suleiman Yang uh, in the back. And we also welcome those of you who will have the opportunity to re review this program online in the future. Stay tuned to our next series in 2014. But right now, please join me in welcoming and Como. Como? Uh, thank you. Uh, you can hear me? Okay. Um, thank you for coming and also thank you for the introduction. You know, uh, it, I, couldn't turn the, I couldn't turn down the invitation to the Library of Congress. I don't know, like it carries such gravitas. I was like, yep, you gotta make it. <laughs> you know, so I, so I was in London just a few, just, I, I, I came in I think two days ago. So if I'm a bit sloppy, I'll blame it on jet lag. <laughs> um, what, what I thought I would do is give you, uh, do a little bit of readings from you know, my three books, one from uh, Black Slay Nairobi, uh, then one from my book of poetry, and then one from Nairobi Heat as a way of, because I've been thinking about you know, my different genres and um, you know, if, if what, if what unites them. You know, and, and I've been thinking it's, it's poetry, uh, and music, so I'll try to read snippets, you know, that sort of tie that in, you know. And I came to, the, to this realization because I'm actually working on a novel about musicians, you know. Because after looking back on my work, I realized, well, maybe I've been trying to write a book about musicians all along. Uh, so, so I'll first read from Blacks and Nairobi. And the passage I want to read, um, it's after, um, uh, after one of the characters has been killed and they, they have been mourning that character. Um, and the, Madi, who is a poet, decides to, as part of that morning, to, you know, to, to recite one of our poems. Um, what I should mention briefly is, because I mentioned The Gambler by Kenny Rogers, is that Kenyans, uh, we love Kenny Rogers, at least my generation. <laughs> <laughs> and in fact, there was, uh, there was I, I, I think it's Jimmy Kimmel, where they invited uh, Kenny Rogers and showed him uh, you know, drunk Kenyans <laughs> singing The Gambler, I don't know. <laughs> <laughs> hey, Maddie, I missed your performance. Janet yelled to drown out the calls for The Gambler to be rewound. Muddy stood up a bit unsteadily and let her dreads hang out. They got the attention of the mourners turned party revelers. A song, a painting, a poem, a word is a story. So let me tell you a story. A story about she seemed lost and smiled as if inviting us to tell her what the story should be. She continued after the pause. Let me tell you a story about a word. One word that is as old as the very earth we walk on. A word that crosses boundaries that swims underneath the currents of culture, a word that is a language, a word that is a language. Let me tell you a story about the word love. When love was born, love was living. This love that was newborn and old, an old woman, this love decided to walk the earth. And young love said to older love, or was it the other way around? Love said to love, love is birth, love is living, and love is death. Love is gentle, love is fierce, love is violent. Love is living and love is death. Love is God and love is the devil. And love forgets more than it remembers. But tonight, this morning that is still a night, she took a deep breath that cut through our quietness. Love is the vehicle that drove us here. Love is all, love is us. So, and then I want to do something a bit unusual, which is to read you the ending of the book. Uh, but I promise there are no spoilers though. <laughs> Um, you know, because what, what happened was, I, I, was reading, um, I, I was reading an essay about writing, you know, and uh, the essay was talking about endings. And then I realized, well, you know, like it would be so much fun to end a novel with a question, you know. So, so I, I'm reading this passage just to show you I could, you know, <laughs> I could end a novel with a question. Um, 
A man selling conga drums laid his load by her feet, pulled one from his pile of wires and, and joined both of them. Madi was syncop syncopating her cadence so that the words and her voice became an instrument, so that it was no longer her words that mattered but her voice. He went on like that, merchant after merchant of different instruments coming to join in, and we had a fucking orchestra of voices and African instruments. And in the middle of them, muddy, arms raised, palms curled inward, her voice rising up and down like a bird gliding over a stormy ocean. I thought I'd had it all, but not the sound of a voice, a tongue, the sound of muddy's voice wrapped around the four-string nyatiti that had now taken the lead improvising above the rest of the instruments. Uh, Nyatiti is a, a four-stringed instrument, you know, from, uh, from Western Kenya, uh, from the Luo people. The music, the single notes held together by Madi's voice, were like a hand guiding me through a nightmare. I wanted to pray. I listened closely. There was a clash of instruments and voices, but there was also some tense harmony in there, like a dinner with quarreling lovers. There was a tug of war, but the more each of them pulled, the more it brought them closer. They were fighting, but not to destroy each other, they are fighting to build. They are fighting. They are calling out to each other. They are competing. It was all to build something they felt we could all use. Something they were offering us to take or leave behind. And once we took it, this rage that was love, this violence that claimed to build what was to become of it, we did not justify a machete or a gun, but the musicians were building. I, on the other hand, did not build. Mary had died, and to bury her, we had killed many more. And to get Sahara for killing Amos, we had killed many more again. It struck me. I was part of the problem. I was just several ranks above the Saharas of this world. So were O and my wife to be muddy. I listened closely, I listened closely, to, the, I listened closely to the voices, the drums and the strings. The refrain was asking a simple question over and over again. Uh, why? Um, and now let me, um, I, I had 10 minutes. Was it? Okay, so let me read you um, a, a poem called uh, Transparencies about uh, the Rwandan genocide. You know, and this is because in, in, bo in both, both, both of the novels uh, are concerned with, uh, in, in Kenya, in, in Blackstone Nairobi, about the post-electoral violence that happened in 2007, right? You know, that's the background to the plot. Uh, and also the war on terror. And then, uh, uh, and then Nairobi hit. Uh, it, 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 I was interested in unearthing I don't know, the intimacies of violence that, ca that came with the, uh, with the genocide in Rwanda. You know, so, and this is a poem I wrote a long time ago. I, I wrote this in probably in the, I don't know, like maybe 2000 or thereabouts, you know, way before I worked on the novel. So, it's, it, so I began to think that some of these things have just been cooking uh, for a long time. Once they lived together, the dead looked like pictures of the dead. And this is a, a quote uh, from Philip Gorovich. The dead, looked like the, the dead looked like pictures of the dead, Philip Gorovich. What is this thing in you that must find meaning at the sharp end of a machete? Hack your wife, then reach into her womb for your unborn child. There is something about a man swinging an ax once, twice, thrice, forced to wipe off a trickle of sweat, and then again and again until brain and blood become mud. In Rwanda, I saw dust capital washed away in floods of blood, and Freud tender in resignation as a million or so people died at the hands of their fathers and brothers. Um, so and, uh, let, me, let me read you uh, the opening pages of, uh, of Nairobi Heat. And I probably should have started with this one so I can tell you the, you know, the, the narrator. Uh, his name is Ishmael. Uh, he's, a, he's an African-American who goes to investigate uh, a murder you know, his suspect is an African uh, in, in Madison, Wisconsin, so it's a professor who teaches there. And um, he finds that to solve the case, he has to go to Kenya, where there are a lot of random refugees. Uh, and he himself is also on a quest, you know, not necessarily, well, they are of identity, you know, but we can discuss some of these things uh, in the, you know, when we're having a discussion. Yeah, and I'll tell you, the, you know, the story behind this, which is, yeah, so I'll tell you that in a, when, when we sit down. A beautiful young blonde was dead, and the suspect, my suspect, was an African male. I was traveling to Africa in search of his past. What I found there would either condemn or save him. As you can imagine, my business was urgent. How many times had I thought of Africa? Not many, I'm afraid. Yes, I knew of, I, yes, I knew of Africa. After all, it was the land of my ancestors, a place I vaguely longed for without really wanting to belong to it. I might as well say it here. 
Coming from the U.S., there was a part of me that had come to believe Africa was a land of wars, hunger, disease, and dirt, even as, even as my black skin pulled me towards it. So how many times had I thought of Africa? Not many, not in a real way. The, very, the funny thing, though, was now that I was actually in a plane on my way to Africa. I found myself surrounded by whiteness, the passengers, the crew, and the pilots. It was early May, and I gathered from the conversations around me that my fellow passengers were business people, tourists and hunters from Texas, the usual, I supposed. I looked outside, watching the full moon hover in the sky beyond the tip of an aeroplane wing, childishly imagining it to be catching a free ride. We traveled for a while like that, the moon surfing on the wing, until the pilot wanders in that proper British accent that we have come to associate with efficiency to prepare for landing. The moon leapt back into the sky as we pierced the clouds, and below I saw what looked like an island of lights engulfed by perfect darkness. Then we landed, and everyone clapped. I was tired and a little tipsy from the complimentary Budweiser's the crew had offered me. And so it was that a little bit drunk, I took my first steps in Africa. Um, yeah, if, if, if you want more, if, if you want more poetry, you know, just let me know. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, can you read another one? Yeah. Oh, okay. So, so okay, let me read you um, a, a poem I wrote. It's called Letter to My Nephew. And it's a poem about Ken Sarawiwa, whom uh, in 1996 was hung by the Nigerian government because he was an activist uh, against the destruction of the environment and exploitation of the Ogoni people. So, and. You know, I remember this very clearly because it was a time when everybody knew that the charges against him had been fabricated. And, um, you know, and I guess the corporations were so strong, you know, that, uh, that even though, you know, amnesty, you know, uh, political activists, politicians, everybody knew uh, he was still hanged. Um, and the story goes that um, they tried to hang him three times. I don't know how people get to know this, you know, but they tried to hang him three times before they finally succeeded. Uh, and this particular poem, the images I use are from my own, you know, I, I grew up in a rural area in Limuru. And where I grew up, there was a swamp where, as kids, I remember, would go and get clay to make pots with my kid sister. Letter to my nephew. The sun is locked in evening, half shadow, half light. Heels spread like hunchbacks over plains, branches bowing to birth of night. It's an almost endless walk until the earth opens up to a basin of water. You gasp. Even the thin hairs on your forearm breathe. Flyers wild, two grays of man and wife, lying in perfect symmetry overrun by wild strawberries. Gently you part the reeds. Water claims the heat from the earth. You soak your feet, then lie down, hands planted into the moist earth. Late at night when you leave, you'll fill your pockets with wet clay. But many years from now, you'll try to find a perfect peace in many different landscapes. Drill water out of memory to heal wounded limbs of the earth. You will watch as machines turn your pond inside out, spit the two graves inside out in search of sleek wealth. Many years later, after much blood has been lost and your pond drained of all life, you'll wonder, shortly before you become the earth's matter, what is this thing that kills not just life, uh, but even death? Uh, do you want me to read up? Uh, so with, um, with Blackstone and Nairobi, I was, I was very concerned uh, about how I would portray the violence. And what I wanted to do was to write the violence in such a way that it wouldn't be voyeuristic. I wanted, I wanted it, it to be in such, to write it in such a way, to make it so physical uh, that as you're reading it, you know, you get a sense of, uh, of, of discomfort. So, um, so I want to see whether I succeeded by seeing if you feel uh, uncomfortable. <laughs> with, with the level of the violence. So, and this is a passage, you know, so, so what happened in Kenya was that there were mamas of, of the violence, right? And I remember um, a friend of mine uh, by the name of Martin Kimani actually uh, emailed a, a bunch of writers, you know, and he said, well, you know, the kind of ch chat I'm hearing, the kind of chat I'm hearing is very different from what we're used to. Because uh, you're saying there was something about the, the language that was being used that was unlike in other elections, right? So, you know, but, you know, but we're Kenyans, so we said, well, uh, Kenyans are scared of bloodshed. You know, after all, we shed so much blood during the uh, independence, you know, the struggle against the, uh, the British that, um, that we are sort of immune to, you know, to what, to, to what happened in Rwanda and so on and so forth. So there are ways in which the violence um, took a lot of us by surprise, even though in hindsight, really, it shouldn't have. 
you know, so so and, and so and the characters sort of mirror that same movement, you know. So you know, they they investigate in their own case of a, you know, of a murdered African American male. This is in Blackstone, Nairobi, and they're just going about their business. And same thing, you know, people keep hearing this chatter, you know, they see machetes from China, uh, and so on and so forth, you know. But they just go about investigating their their, you know, they go on about their business, and then suddenly they find themselves caught up uh, in the in the in the, uh, in, the, in, the in the violence. So and then they have no choice, you know. But if, if they want to survive, essentially they have to go. They have to fight back. So and I want to read you a passage uh, where now they have, um, you know, uh, where they have, where they have essentially have been chased by a group of, uh, of, of, of essentially young men and uh, some policemen, you know, who had taken the side, you know, who had been broken along the side of ethnicity, uh, in in a, in a tea plantation. A few rows down, I hear an AK-47. It's not us, and I calm the fear that comes with knowing the efficiency of the weapon. I crawl on my belly and hide between some bushes as two machetes swish past me. I kill them both, shoot them in the back and advance and keep crawling on my stomach, waiting so I can pick out the AK. An AK fires in my direction and I stay down as the minty wet tea leaf smell wafts my way. Guided by the silhouette, and his long police overcoat hidden against the leaves, I shoot at the mass. He falls, I crawl to him. I can feel his warm blood against the coolness of the dead leaves on the ground. I slither, groping for his extra magazines. I find them, tuck my Glock into the small of my back and pick up his AK. I have an AK-47, I shout to my comrades. More AK fire coming from the rear and once again I wait and then continue crawling until the policeman is almost standing over me. He sees or senses me, but it's too late to recoil his arms and clear the length he needs for the AK. I edge just a little bit closer, spin onto my back and fire the AK into his chin. He topples backwards. I can feel a sudden burst of rainwater, but I know his blood splattering on my face. Before he hits the ground, I'm on one knee firing into whoever is behind. We slowly and mercilessly and methodically dig a hole through their rear guard. We sound more organized. The young men and what is left of the police force lose all the will to fight. They slow down and keep slowing down until ahead and around us there are no more flashlights. We make it to the clearing and back to the path to the house. It's only then that we realize Gatia, one of the characters was with them. Uh, it's, it's only then we realize that Gatia is not with us. And we start to hear O's, 0.45 reporting back to us, followed by a yell, then silence. Muddy places her hand on my shoulder. I shudder at her touch. She spins me around so that I'm looking at her, her face glowing from the flames of the burning house. How many, how many of them were armed, she asked. I don't know, Madi, all of them, some of them, I say. Not all, not all of them had guns. Not all of them could even, ha could even have had sharpened machetes, you understand? Some of them were young, jobless, hopeless men. Peer, pressured. Peer pressure forced some of them to belong to the gang. If amnesty comes here tomorrow and they count the bodies, this will be a massacre no matter what we say. But you know what you know, okay? Should we have left Mary's parents to burn with the house so that we could escape? Should we have let them kill us? Muddy, enough, oh yells from the driver's seat. Enough, we need to get the hell out of here. I did not ask her which day in Rwanda or tonight in Lemuru. We make it to her place and we sit up all night waiting for them to regroup and attack. They don't, and Sunrise finds us with all lost in thought trying to make his omelette. So for O making the omelette, you know, he has been making this omelette, he has been trying to, he's sort of obsessive compulsive, he has been trying to perfect making an omelette, you know, for 10 or so years. So it's the only thing he makes, you know, and sometimes it comes out well and sometimes it doesn't. Okay. Well, thank you. Thank you very much. And um, I uh, welcome you here and I want to let you know you did give away part of all because I've read Nairobi Heat, oh, so no. you gave away part of Black Star Nairobi, but that's okay. Um, so I wanted to start uh, our discussion by asking you, when did you start writing? And also, if you could talk about the relationship between your critical work, journalism, and literary writing. You know, my, my, father, my, my, my father is a writer, you know, so um, when I was growing up, you know, I was his errand boy, so to speak, you know, so he sent me to get him tea, to buy the newspapers, you know, <laughs> you know, and then I would come and just hang out in his office, you know, and, um, you know, 
it's, I don't know, so, so the idea of writing, I, I had the idea of writing, uh, I had that idea from a very, very young age. But my first written work, I would say, I was probably like nine. You know, I, I remember it vaguely, it was a poem uh, about two boxers. I don't know why, <laughs> but, you know. Um, in terms of the relationship between my, my different genres, I, I like to think of it as, 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 music, as a musician does, which is to be able to play multiple instruments. And each one of them does something different, you know. I, I think the poetry captures the, the, the poetry by definition is intimate, you know, so it captures an intimacy uh, and allows me to explore emotion in ways that I can't or don't uh, in fiction. Uh, with the fiction, it allows me to take my characters to extreme situations, you know, so, and then see what, see what they do. So in, um, uh, in, in Black Stone, Nairobi, and Nairobi Heat, you know, the, the settings, they are extreme situations. Uh, and I can do that in ways that I can't in, uh, in let's say, political writing, you know, because in political writing you're supposed to know. I mean, you can't end, I guess you could, but generally speaking, you can't write an op-ed and end with a question. You know, so I don't, the, the fiction, well, I can take the characters to, to, to extremes uh, and at the same time be allowed not to know, right? Uh, whereas with political writing, there is usually a more immediate, uh, immediate, um, uh, immediate issue I'm addressing. You know, but really, uh, I, I went to see a, a, a Ray Charles concert. This is uh, in the early 2000s. You know, and what, what, was about him was, uh, what was interesting about him was that he could play the clarinet, the piano, he could sing. You know, so I like to think of myself as a, as a Ray Charles, <laughs> as a Ray Charles of generous. I think we have to, I think we have to share this mic today. Um, so what or who are the major influences on your work? Um, I mean, I, I would definitely say the single most um, influence is actually my father, you know? Because uh, I've spent a lot of time talking with, uh, with young African writers and for them, the, there's nothing between them and a book, right? You know, they see a book uh, and there's nothing that guides them towards writing a book, right? You know, so in Kenya, for example, we have one major journal. So for a population of 40 something million, uh, you have one journal. And for the whole of Africa, you, we have maybe like 10 literary journals. So we don't have creative writing, you know, from a young age and so on and so forth. But for me, because I, I grew up seeing writing being done, you know, I could see the different drafts, I could see, I guess, the, the work of it. Uh, I never, I never had doubts, you know, as to whether I could write a book. So, so in that regard, uh, it has been very influential uh, in, in terms of in terms of writing as a dream. Uh, but in terms of now, you know, artistic or aesthetic influences, there's definitely, um, you know, Gerald Barracks. He's, a, he's he's not a well-known poet, uh, but his most uh, his most famous book, I guess, is a, it's an it's called an audience of one. And what I liked about Gerald Barracks, was, it, 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 about that particular book, was his ability to, to tell a story uh, in a very beautiful way. Right? Uh, you know, like one of, the, one of his poems uh, is about uh, uh, driving you know, at night, you know, and then uh, getting home, and then you can look at the windshield, and, uh, you know, and there are all these bugs you know, that have died. And so and he, he asks them, you know, I mean, if I can do this to this, you know, to, to these bugs, why can't a, a bigger power do it to me? So I don't know. So he, he and you know, and also he, he writes sonnets, and he says he writes sonnets because he can. Um, there are other people like uh, Walter Mosley, uh, double in a blue dress, um, that has directly influenced my, you know, my, my thrillers or my crime fiction uh, because he's able to within the form of, of crime. You know, crime is supposed to be, you know, if you look at people like Raymond Chandler, uh, you know, it's supposed to be, usually it's a white, yeah, a white detective, and maybe a little bit drunk, you know, um, a little bit sexist, uh, <laughs> um, you know, who at the end of the day restores order, right? Uh, but what people like Walter Mosley has done is to take the same genre and be able to talk about uh, African-American issues, identity issues, uh, so race issues and class. You know, and others like Sarah Paretsky as well. You know, same thing, the same genre, and take it and be able to talk about issues of gender. You know, within with, within the framework of a thriller. You know, so but my influences are, are, are wide. You know, Russian literature, Dostoevsky. Um, you know, the, the the my PhD was on John Clare, and there's someone who described him as hard, that as he didn't have uh, an, an, uh, an aristocracy of beauty, right? You know, because for him, he could write about the, the most mundane thing or the most highest thing. 
And so I, I, in terms of my reading, I'm, I'm that way as well. I don't have a, an aristocracy of what I read. So I read James Hadley Chase. You know, that's what we grew up reading, you know. I don't know if the Kenyans here, they'll know David Milo, <laughs> you know, who wrote the shortest, uh, essentially pornography, though maybe that like that big. Uh, you know, but we'd read that alongside Shakespeare. You'd, you know, you'd stick the book, you know, between, um, you know, between your Shakespeare book in class. You know, yeah, so, so a lot, I saw a lot of popular writing as well, yeah. Okay, um, I think you kind of partially answered this earlier, but mm -hmm. why did you choose to write popular fiction, specifically the crime novel, mm -hmm. as your creative outlet? Um, well, it's, uh, as, uh, for many reasons. You know, the first one is to, uh, to sort of pay homage to people like David Milo. In fact, you know, Nairobi Heat, I dedicated to David Milo and uh, Major Mwangi. Uh, because when writers like my father uh, was and Bishara Moga were sent off to prison and exile, there was this gap uh, in terms of in terms of literature, and really it's the popular writers who kept you know you know that, that, that literature alive, you know. So if you read well, like What a Life or you know by by Mwangi or Hemi, or yeah What a Life or What a Husband, you know he had a series of body books. Uh, you find they're entertaining, but they also carry the politics of the day, you know, joblessness, uh, being in the city, city versus rural, uh, and sometimes they will, they will carry even the politics of the Mau Mau. So, so in a way, I wanted to, to, to sort of pay homage, uh, you know, to those guys. But at the same time, I, I wanted to challenge the idea of high and low, you know, because you know, it bothers me, it bothers me that, um, that, that somehow we live in a world where you know, I, I, crime novels are seen as less, you know. But yet we go to movies and enjoy them and talk about them, right? Um, so so I, I, I wanted to challenge that division of high and low, you know. And, you know, um, I'm, I, I'm a literary scholar, you know. So, so I wanted to be able to do that, I, I guess, was a way of... Um, yeah, and, and also wanted to be read, you know. I mean, I, want, I, I don't want to write, you know, a scholarly book that's going to be read by two people, you know. <laughs> you know, I want to be read as well. You know, and, and also to entertain, you know. Uh, like this is proving to be a long story, but um, when, when my father was sent to exile, uh, when, we, when we grew up under a lot of our political pressure, right? uh, but what we do as a family is we would get together and tell stories, you know. So, you know, I hear stories from my grandmother, but mostly there was this character called Mongi Cowboy uh, that it turns out is my dad would introduce him. So, Mongi Cowboy is a badass, you know. Um, you know, anti-authority, you know, goes around solving issues. So, and my brothers would tell me that story. Of course, I wouldn't know they're making it up on the spot, you know, and with my sister, we are too young. You know, but, so, but we grew up with that tradition of stories and being able to tell an entertaining story. So I also wanted to do that. I wanted to tell a story uh, that's just fun to read. Uh, and, and also I've said that I, want, I like when you go to a movie and the movie is so good that people clap at the end. You know, I wanted to write a novel that that would make you clap at the end, you know. Now I don't know if that worked, but <laughs> that was my ambition. <laughs> okay, great. Um, I did want to ask, before I get to the next question, um, mm. I understand Nairobi Heat has been optioned for a movie? Um, well, it, it's been optioned, but it's not looking promising. You know, <laughs> so, you know and it's, it's one of those things um, where it might happen uh, and it might not. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I mean, I'm hoping it does, you know, like it, it would be good for for the pocket, you know? <laughs> yeah. Okay, in your novels, Nairobi Heat and Black Star Nairobi, you have two main characters. Mm -hmm. Why did you choose those two characters and why did you choose to extend their story beyond mm -hmm. the first novel? Um, so, I've always been interested in, in my other writing, I've always been interested in the question of, uh, of Africans and African Americans, you know, especially since I've been here now. I was born in Illinois, went to Kenya, and then came back, and I've now been here for 20-something years. So, and I've always been interested in, if, if you think of Obama, right, uh, to African Americans, he's a black American. Uh, to Kenyans, he's Kenyan, right? And, and it's very rare you hear Kenyans talk about slavery or, you know, what Barack, what Barack Obama means to African Americans here, you know, the history here. And vice versa, it's very rare you hear African Americans having a discussion about what Obama might mean. Uh, to Kenya, so so I've always been interested in uh, in how in, in how Africans and African Americans view view each other, and I've argued also that uh, that they see each other through the eyes of racism. You know, because if you grow up here, you grow up 
Uh, you grow up uh, watching uh, same stereotypical views of Africa as everybody else. And if you grow up in Kenya, as I did, you grow up with the same stereotypical views of, uh, of, uh, of African Americans. So when, when, when the two of us meet, they, they is that, I don't know, we, we are really seeing, that, seeing each other through that veil, right? And it creates a lot of tension. So I don't know, so, so I wanted to have a character, you know, Ishmael, who is African American, uh, who is having a quest of identity, and, and put him in Kenya, and then see what will happen, right? And a lot of interesting, a lot of th interesting things happening. He asserts himself. You know, he's able to assert himself after being called Mzungu. You know, he learns that already people are calling him Mzungu, which means a uh, white person or foreigner. You know, so the first time he sort of he sort of laughs. The second time, and then the third time he beats up the guy. Uh, <laughs> you know, you know. So, so, but yes. Yeah, so, so, but I, I wanted to be able to explore, you know, the issues of African and African Americans through Ishmael. With oh, oh, oh I was interested in. Um, in the duality of, of people I've met along the way. Uh, it, it, very violent people, but at the same time who you can sit down and have a beer with. And all came about because when my parents went back to Kenya in 2002, after my dad was in exile, they went back and they were attacked. And the people who attacked them uh, were arrested and, uh, and, 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 and put on trial. Now, whenever we go for the trial, because of the danger, would be, we, we had to be under police protection. You know, so some detectives were assigned, you know, to my father, you know, so, so we spent an immense time together, right? You know, that's when I started thinking, like, this, these guys, they could have just as, as easily been told, you know, go, you know, go put him in jail, and they wouldn't, it, it would be the same movement, so with the same, uh, with the same energy they are, they are protecting us, it's the same energy they can, you know, destroy our lives. But there was this one particular, there was this one particular detective whom, you know, whom I liked, you know, and he was telling you the story of how he got cut up. Uh, you know, and he said, well, you know, the guy came, uh, they, they carjacked us. And of course, you know, I had to speak for myself. You know, in Kiswahili it's an ikajitatea, which means, uh, he had to speak for myself, I had to stand up for myself. So he didn't say, you know, and then I ducked and shot and blah, blah, blah. He just, you know, in, in a very understated way. So, so in a way, oh, I wanted all to carry that sort of, um, I don't know, easy violence, you know, and to explore violence through all. Uh, with Mandy, with, with Maddie, uh, the question of, of can we heal through poetry, can we heal through words, you know, she's a, she's a survivor, she's a survivor of the Rwandan genocide, uh, who was also a fighter in the RPF, so she can also be extremely violent, you know, and when you read the books, you can see that uh, if I'm black, she, she's uh, more violent than Ishmael and all. Uh, but at the same time, she's a poet, so she's trying to heal through, to heal herself through poetry. So I wanted to explore that, you know, can we heal through words? Yeah. Okay, uh, my next question. Um, you were born in the United States, but raised in Kenya and returned to the United States for your higher education. Can you talk a little bit about the state of contemporary literature in Kenya and also about immigrant literature, how you connect to or what to challenge uh, in that term? Uh, I'm sorry, what was the first part of the question? <laughs> The first part of the question was, uh, can you talk about the state of contemporary literature in Kenya? Okay. Yeah, I know, you know, it, 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 it's thriving, you know, and uh, this is uh, due to Kwani, you know, you, you might, if you are familiar with Kenyan literature, then you know Binyabango in Aina, he won the Kane Prize, and like me, he was shortlisted, <laughs> but he, he won the Kane Prize in 2001, and what he did with the money that he won uh, was to start a journal called Kwani, you know, so it, it sort of revived, you know, the, the, the Kenyan literary scene. Uh, there is the Story Moja Festival, you know, that brings, I don't know if you heard about uh, the, the, the embassy, uh, the, the, the Westgate Mall attacks, you know, there was a poet who was killed, uh, his name is Kofi Awuna, and he was there for the Story Moja Festival, you know, and the Story Moja Festival is there too, has been very instrumental in reviving the literary scene. But for me, the most exciting thing to come out of Kenya recently is a book called Tales of Kasaya, by Eva Kasaya, you know. And it, Kasaya it, it was, was a maid, you know, so, and so it's a perspective from a maid. Um, you know, and, and, and I kept thinking, you know, so for us, for us who are progressive thinkers, I mean, even in my own books, I'll have, you know, I'll have a progressive take on the maid, you know, uh, either somebody will discuss uh, in, a, in positive ways and so on and so forth. But not, but this is the first time I think we are seeing, uh, we have seen literature, that's a book written by a maid. Uh, and, and, and when you read it, you realize, actually how little Kenya has changed. 
Because of course, you know, it's a class perspective, and she's writing as a, as a member actually of the underclass. And if you read it, and somebody told you this is a book from the 1930s under British colonialism, you'd believe it. Uh, I don't know if you, have, if you have been to a rich person's home in Kenya, uh, you know, like Runda, and, you know, you go to somebody's house and they'll have a chef, you know, in a chef outfit. Uh, they'll have a maid in a maid outfit. Uh, they'll have a servant's quarters, you know, so at any rate, that, to me, that is a, I don't know, I think it indicates the future of, of African literature, actually, when to have more voices, you know, so, so then it's not always people like me who, who think we are speaking for, you know, we are being progressive, but really, we're also uh, denying our agency. I, I just sort of, uh, now this is the scholar in me coming up, because I just sort of, um, uh, of Spivak's, can you sort of out and speak? You know, it's, it's, a, it's a brilliant essay because it's asking that question. So I think Eva Kasai is able to say yes, you know, and, um, and, 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 and give the book as, as, a, as, as a way of saying she can speak. And the second part was about immigrant literature? Oh, I was trying to avoid that. <laughs> <laughs> okay. <laughs> um, so with if the term immigrant literature, you know, okay, so, so, so categories have their place. Others wouldn't be, you know, language wouldn't have wouldn't have a foothold, you know. I, if, for example, I could say, well, you know, literature written by people from Kenya, then you'd have to name all the countries in the world, you know, if, if we didn't say immigrant literature. But, but then it also has the problem of, uh, of imprisoning, uh, of, of imprisoning uh, the literature. So you can have immigrant literature in, uh, you know, the same, the same complaint we have about African, the, the, the term African writers, you know, to me it's an important category, but at the same time, it can imprison. In fact, um, when I was in London, the most pleasing thing was to, we were there with uh, Ben Oakley, you know, and my dad, and um, anyway, it was a funny story, so I'll tell it to you anyway. Um, so we so we got there, and because my dad wanted some books uh, written by Ben Oakley, and then he told the the person who was, who was selling the books, oh, by the way, this is Ben Oakley, you know, and then she got really really excited, you know, and they went and got some books, brought them down, and signed, you know, then he signed them. Then as he was signing, he told her, oh yeah, by the way, this is good one, you know. You know? <laughs> so she got really really excited, you know, and we had brought more books, you know, and then finally my dad was like, oh yeah, this is Mukama, my son, he writes. And then she went and she couldn't find my books. I was like, wow, this is not good. <laughs> you know, please find my book. But then she realized, oh, yeah, the books, they're in the crime section. Yeah, so she went and, um, and, and got them from the crime section. From the crime section. And, and for me, I like that, actually. You know, you know so, and, and, so and the argument we had there was, well, you know, should it be also, you know, in the, in the section where, you know, uh, Ben O'Cris and my dad's books are. And we ended, up, we ended up agreeing that she should have some of them in the crime section and some of them with the, with, with the African literature. I, I don't know, so, so I was telling that story to say, for me, I was happy to have my book in the crime section as opposed to either under immigrant uh, or, or even African literature. You know, so, so, I, so I, I think we have to be careful with categories. You know, we don't want them to imprison, you know, to imprison the literature. Yeah. Okay, thank you. You participate in the Global South Cultural Dialogue Project at Cornell University where you now teach. Mm -hmm. um, can you discuss the initiative and what is your role in it? Um, the Global South Project, the, the goal is to, so if you look at post-colonial theory, if you look at a lot of, uh, of, of the work we do as scholars, it's usually in relation to the West, right? Uh, if you look at, uh, let's say, hybridity, uh, deconstruction, et cetera, et cetera, it's always in relation uh, to the West, you know, uh, or even yeah, hybridity. It's about you know spaces uh, that have been that, that exist in the West. Um, and for us, we wanted to have a conversation uh, that would be that would you know that would that would level that would level the playing field, right? You know, so so we wanted to have a conversation where you know between Africa and Latin America, for example, so south to south or. Uh, or between Africans and African Americans, or between uh, Africans and uh, poor whites. You know, we wanted to get away from, from that idea of uh, that we can only, in the same way, sometime back to fly from Kenya to, let's say, Ghana, you have to go through Europe. You know, we wanted to break that, you know, to break the, um, that reliance on, on, uh, on you know, on, on European thinking, uh, and, allow, and, and allow for historically available relationships to, um, to come to, to come to come to the fore, uh, because even in literature, a lot of African writers have been influenced by Latin American writers. But if we keep if we keep always saying, "Yeah, let's deconstruct the West," then we are not looking, we are not unearthing 
uh, these existing relationships. You know, so, so that was one side of it, allowing people from, uh, from the global south to be in conversation with each other. The other one was to get away from academia that also hides knowledge, right? You know, either in very obscure language, in very typical language that, quite frankly, I don't understand, and I highly doubt. <laughs> if you go to a conference where that, that language is being used, I really, really doubt whether anybody understands each other. It's, it's, uh, to, me, to me, it's as if, you know, people agree, no, nobody should say the emperor is naked, you know? So people sit there and they use these big terms, and really there's nothing being said. So for us, we wanted to be able to take these ideas from the global south and talk about them in ways that anybody uh, can access them. And then at the same time, to have these ideas be out in newspapers, uh, be out in journals, and so on and so forth. So for the first project, uh, for the first forum that we did on, um, on chauvinism and literature, some of the essays appeared in a, in, in, in a newspaper in Kenya, in Nigeria, uh, and then also some world well literature today in the US, um, it, uh, generally in India, and so on and so forth. So, so it, it's, it, it's, it's a way of getting ideas tested out there. As to my role, I was one of the people who initiated it with a, in, together with, a, you know, with I think some people in, outside the university and also others within the university, like Sakya Mohanty. Yeah. Okay, my last question before we open it up to the audience to ask mm -hmm. questions um, is kind of our boilerplate question. Mm -hmm. How do you see the future for African and African diaspora writers what steps need to be taken to broaden the readership of African literature to the international community? Uh, you know, in, in, in terms of bringing or uh, making African writer, writing be more available internationally, so, so what has been happening is young people like me, you know, who first get published here, and then uh, somehow, you know, try to get our books back to, you know, to Kenya. For example, like Nairobi Heat, it came out uh, in South Africa early 2009. Uh, and then to 2011 here, and it's only a few months ago when it got published in Kenya. Uh, Finding Sahara or, or, or Black Sun Nairobi hasn't been published in Kenya yet. Uh, so, so that has been the model. But I actually think for African literature to flourish, it's not for more of us to come and follow that model. It's actually for to have a thriving you know, publishing industry. You know? So for me, what would make me happy actually would be to have my book first be a success in Kenya. You know, and then and then from that success, Ghanaian reputation, and then slowly work its way, you know, work its way to the international market. You know, so so for me, I view the other way around. That we really, if if we want African literature to thrive, then it, it, we, this this model we are using is not, you know, is is not very good for the for, for the African literary tradition. Um, so and, you know, and, and also the, the the other thing we also need to think about is um, is is how we are viewing uh, literary criticism. You know, there's a lot of criticism now of, of, of literature that's written by, for example, no violence book, we need new names, you know, that was critiqued uh, solely on whether it portrayed a positive or a negative view of Africa, right? You know, so, so there's a criticism that's coming out that, that wants African writers to work for the tourism board, right? You know, they want us to be out here as, a, as ambassadors of Africa, you know, but that is, but, but that is not the role of, of, of literature. You know, it is to question, it is to look at contradictions uh, within societies. So, for me, I'm finding that, that sort of criticism, because it's silencing, you know, like Nova Alex's book, uh, it's a brilliant book, you know, that talks about, first aesthetically, it's very, very beautiful, it's very, very beautifully written. Uh, but in the same time, it's exploring, you know, questions of, uh, let's say, language redistribution in, in Zimbabwe, what is it for, uh, who, who gained it from it? Uh, or questions of, of China, the China presence in, uh, uh, in, uh, in, uh, in Africa, that, it's raising those sort of questions. It's also raising questions of our, of our own existence here in the U.S. You know, if, if we keep thinking that the diaspora is here to feed Africa's image, then we're missing out on a lot of things that are happening. You know, so and some time back, my father and I were invited to uh, to Seattle to uh, to meet with uh, Kenya. We actually, were invited by the Kenya. There was a Kenyan youth organization, and they were inviting us because we were saying. We need you, you need, we need you guys to come out here and talk with us because we are, we are a community in crisis. You know, some of the things that were happening, uh, either drugs, uh, not finishing college, um, you know, and then other things for, you know, the parents are not documented, so it's the children who, you know, who, who then have to, who become the de facto parents, or families being broken up because somebody has been deported, you know, because of papers. Like, you know, so what the, what, the, what the Republicans have been doing is using, I don't know, you can call it a doctrine of attrition which is to make it impossible for you to live in the U.S. if you don't have papers, right? 
you know, so, so and a lot of families, I mean, not, not just Kenyans, you know, but a lot of immigrant families have been affected. So I, a no violence book touches on some of those things. So if, if, if we keep judging this sort of literature on the basis of, uh, of whether it's really a positive image, it means then more serious questions, more urgent questions uh, of our existence here in the US uh, are not being explored. Okay, at this point, my questions are uh, done. Um, I did want to acknowledge um, the presence of our last uh, African poet and writer, Abdul Rahman Waberi, who came to visit. Um, and I want to, at this time, take, uh, take this opportunity to open up the floor to questions from the audience. I'm quite sure you have many. And Rob Casper will pass the microphone. <coughs> Uh, two quick questions. Um, one, an extension of what uh, the author asked, the state of popular writing in East Africa. Um, I'm just wondering how diverse it is, uh, both and, and, and reading. In other words, you know, both objectively, like what's the circulation of publication, and subjectively when they're together with people, what do they talk about? Uh, do, do, do books enter that conversation at all? Is it mostly just movies or TV? Or, What's there? That's my first question. Mm -hmm. And my second question is, you explore issues of identity. Mm -hmm. An old thing that I haven't heard explored much lately is the role of language in that. Mm -hmm. And I'm wondering if there's popular writing and reading in, mm -hmm. not just English, but Kiswati, Kiku, mm -hmm. Luo. Is mm -hmm. there literature out there that still acts in that? Um, okay, so so I, I can only answer anecdotally, because it's, it, it, you know, so, so you can't quote me. <laughs> but um, you know, I, I think, OK, first, it, it, the, the question of readership. All right, so it, for me, it's a very complicated question, because you know, we say Africans don't read. But then how much do the books cost? You know, I mean, it, you know, if it's a question of, of, uh, of, of bread or a book, you know, um, you know then, then the person will choose the bread, right? Um, then also, you know, when I go to Kenya, people are interested in, in what I'm doing, interested in the literature. Uh, I, I, did, I wasn't there for the latest Kwani. Uh, Kwani, Kwani was celebrating his 10th year of existence. And, uh, if, and they held, you know, they held a lot of um, events. And they were all packed, you know. When, when, when Chimamanda went to, uh, to University of Nairobi, it's as if she was giving a presidential, you know, it, it's as if she was giving a presidential address, but, you know, people all over, you know. When we've been there with my dad, same thing. So, so I, 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 think, I think there's an interest of reading. It's a question of whether the books are... You know, whether, whether we are, the books are getting to the people in a way they can access them. Uh, in terms of popular fiction, I, I'm not really sure. I, I know Kiswahili has been doing well, you know. Um, you know, but I, I, I can't say, I, I, I don't know for sure. I can't answer that one, you know, with any, with any confidence. Other questions? Yes. Mm -hmm. Your own thought is very interesting and well known to all of us. Mm -hmm. He began his career writing in English, mm -hmm. and then he went into Kisahiri. Mm -hmm. Oh, Kikuyu. Kikuyu. Uh, yeah. yeah. What, mm -hmm. Why did he do that, and what is the significance of that mm -hmm. for Kenyans, mm -hmm. uh, and what's the impact of that kind of writing? Mm -hmm. Is that more accessible, for example, to Kenyans? Well, I mean, yeah, it, it is. It is accessible. And, and one of the stories, you know, he tells is of a uh, of, of, uh, of, of, of him. So the simplest explanation he has given is that, um, and, and to me the most elaborate one as well, is that he wanted to, read, he wanted to write a book his mother could read. You know, because you know, his mother, my grandmother, couldn't read English, right? You know, and there's something, I, I don't know, I mean, uh, yeah, I, I, you want to be read by your mother. <laughs> you know, so, but, but then of course that contains a lot of other issues of, um, of, of, of the role of English as a, um, as, as, as a language of upward social mobility, you know, as a, as a language of economics, you know, and, and the role of English then in, uh, in disempowering uh, African languages. You know, so, and, you know, if you go back to, to, to how English grew, if you look at the, the history of English, uh, you'll find people like Chaucer and Shakespeare, uh, but people like Chaucer were writing against the grain, you know, it, it, when they were writing in the 1300s, you couldn't use uh, English was seen as, as a vulgar language. That's, that, that's the term they would use. They say English is a vulgar language. Uh, and then when you get to people like Samuel Johnson in, in the 1500s or 1600s, uh, when you're solidifying, when you're standardizing the dictionary, uh, in his preface he says that, um, that for him, 
uh, authors are the, you know, authors essentially are the, are the, are the cream of the nation, you know, I, I forget exactly how he terms it, but he's saying that authors are, writers are, are carry, essentially carry the nation's identity. So, but at any rate, English had to fight uh, against, um, you know, against French and Latin, you know, um, and, uh, and uh, then African languages have to do the same, you know, they have to fight uh, against English. But for him, he's very careful to say that he's not saying that English shouldn't be used, you know. Um, he wants a more democratic space for, language, for languages to meet equally. Uh, I, when I was growing up, and he himself as well, but when I was, when I was going to school in the 70s, um, we would get punished if we spoke Ikuyu, right? Uh, and I, I remember like some of my friends would get together during the break time, you know, you know during break time, and would hide somewhere and speak Ikuyu as if, it's, um, as if we were doing something illegal. Um, you know, you know, you know the court case. Actually, you know the court case that we attended uh, for the people who, uh, the people who, were, who attacked him when they were being tried. Uh, the court case, the court itself was being conducted in English. Now the guys who had attacked them don't speak English, so you have to have an interpreter. And this is a Kenyan court, you know, so you have to have an interpreter who then was using Kiswahili, right? And these guys, uh, Kiswahili isn't that good, you know. Kenyans, uh, Kiswahili sort of. <laughs> It has sort of suffered, you know. So, so in a way, it was almost like justice twice removed, you know. It, until very recently, the constitution was uh, was only in English, and so on and so forth. So, so I think for him, what he wants more than anything is a is a democratic, uh, a democratic playing field for all languages. But to go back also to the question of identity, you know, what, what amongst you know the kids in Seattle who who had invited uh, invited us there, the one thing they all had in common was that they didn't speak an African language and they felt that they, they needed to be able to speak an African language. And it, it's for complex reasons, right? But one of, the, one of the reasons why they didn't speak any African language is because their parents, when, when their parents come here, like everybody else, they want their kids to assimilate. You know, so, so, so the whole idea is then speak English, speak English. But what, what happens then is that, and they'll also give them a name like Mokoma, right? You know, you know so, so if you're bringing up a kid in the U.S. called Mokoma, what's, what's, the, what's the refrain? You know, it'll always be, where are you from? Where are you from? And they, won't have any, they don't have any way of, uh, of answering that question. You know, so, but language, so one of the things some, some of them were doing was, um, it was forming, uh, forming groups where they could then be taught either Kikuyu or Kiswahili or Luo. So I don't know, la language, language is central. It is central to one's, uh, to one's identity. You know, and, and yeah, yeah, yeah. Any other questions? I think we have time for one more. Thank you again for your wonderful, wonderful presentation and for your thought-provoking remarks. Um, I wanted to ask you, it, it, is, it is really something that I've been thinking of mm. for, for quite a while. And um, you put it in, in, your, in the form of quoting um, a form of literature, African literature, mm. or Latin American literature, or Indian literature. Mm. Uh, and you think of Latin American, you think of Marquez, Marquez, you think of, uh, you think of yeah, the Indian uh, literature, genre, etc. And that this confines, mm. limits, boxes in uh, mm. literature. If you, if you don't, if you remove mm. the, the qualifying mm. adjective, um, do you think that the uniqueness of a particular mm. voice, genre, expression, mm. description uh, would become diluted, or do you think it would become free from mm. any? And, and this is this is true. I mean, it goes beyond mm. you know literature. It goes it goes mm. into other fields. But is there? Mm. Uh, is there a freeing aspect mm -hmm. to removing, but also is there mm -hmm. a diluting influence in removing a particular label mm -hmm. from the genre of literature? Well, I, I, I actually think it, it would do both, right? Um, the, the way I look at it, there's a question of, of the intrinsic quality of, of the novel, right? That has nothing to do with reception. It's, so the categories, can, we can think of them when we say, when you go to a, you're writing a review or reading a review and it says, uh, you know, African literature, we, we need to have more cell phones, you know, in our literature. Um, that, that's, that, that's, that's a question of reception, 
you know, but but if but then there's a question of, of the intrinsic quality of the novel, you know. You know, and I think I, I, I think that one wouldn't get diluted. I think if I wrote, you know, Nairobi Heat, whether it's called African literature or not, will carry a unique uh, cultural, you know, questions, unique, unique questions about, you know, uh, either culture here or culture in Kenya. Right? So, so, so I, I think the main problem really is the question of, uh, of, of, of reception, something outside the book. Um, you know, I, I think a solution is actually to have, okay, to have to allow the books also also to migrate within a within a bookstore, for example, you know, so have one in African literature, but then also have them in other sections, Be because people discover books. One of one of the problems with, with those categories is uh, people discover books by browsing. Right? Uh, but if you're an African book, then it, to to stumble across an African book in a bookstore, you have to go to the Africa section, you know. So so there's there's that question of discovery. Um, myself, I think. It's important to be able to talk about African literature, you know, and I think it's also usage. Now, people will argue. Um, I just saw an interview with uh, Teresa Selassie where she was saying that uh, that there is no such thing, as, no such thing as African literature because African literature, uh, because we have over fifty-four countries and have thousands and thousands of, of languages and so on and so forth, which is true. But when I say Afri when I say African literature, I don't mean that there's only one kind, right? You can use that term and without losing, without losing the great diversity of, uh, of peoples, you know? Same thing in Pan-Africanism, if I say Africa, I don't mean there's, all, there's only one person and only one, you know, and, you know, and, and only one culture. We, a name, one single name can carry the complexity, you know? I, I think the problem with, um, with, 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 when it comes to Africa is if I say, if I say European literature, uh, then somebody will, uh, will understand immediately there is that, you know, that you're not talking about one book or, you know, one writer. But when you say African literature, there is that assumption, you know. But, but because, I don't think because there are issues with reception, we should run away from, from categories. I think we just need to talk about them in a way that allows for their complexity. You know, so in other words, we, we should do something that allows what, what you just said, something that, that allows... Um, that frees the books, you know, that allows them to, you know, to, to be in, in neighbors with other books uh, from other different cultures and nations and genres. Um, but at the same time, yeah, you know, it, it, we need a name. We need, uh, actually, to go, to go back to uh, not violet, we need new names. <laughs> yeah. Well, I want to uh, thank everybody for coming. I would be remiss by not mentioning that next Thursday, December 12th, mm -hmm. marks the Kenyan Jubilee, 50 years mm -hmm. of yeah. independence. Um, mm -hmm. So we've seen, uh, a lot of us are familiar with Nguvi Watiango's literature, which marked uh, a lot of the uh, voice of the beginning of independence. Mm -hmm. And now we've seen the transition through the sun to contemporary literature, uh, dealing with Kenya, not Kenyan literature. We won't <laughs> box it in like that. But um, I think this has been a very enlightening conversation. I want to thank Makoma Wangugi for giving us uh, some insight. And um, thank you all for coming to this program. Thank you very much. Thank you for having me as well. This has been a presentation of the Library of Congress. Visit us at loc.gov.